we're starting a little earlier than I had on the calendar, which is good, because any time I talk, it's like trying to put 12 pounds of rice into an eight-pound bag. Um, I don't, and I never, I could always have more time. I could always use more time. And in fact, I'm going to already jump ahead to the end of the schedule and say, I told Rodney this morning, you've got 20 minutes on the calendar for a Q&A with the group, and I'm happy to stay longer. I know that you're supposed to adjourn at 3 o'clock, and if people need to go, they should go. But at the same time, I've got till 3.30 before I need to go off to something else. And our friends from Commonwealth were here yesterday afternoon for a, a, a meeting in the afternoon. And I, and I really enjoyed talking to them, but we, of course, ran out of time. There's more we want to talk about than time allowed. And so just on the assumption that there may be more that you want to talk about than time allows, let's say that we'll build in as much time at the end of the day for questions as possible. Hi, Ann. How are you? Uh, well, welcome to the Texas Tribune. Uh, we are 17 days from being in business for 10 years, and no one is more surprised to be telling you that than I am. Um, I think on the fourth day, I went home. Andrea knows my wife, Julia. Uh, she said to me, how's it going? And I said, I think I need to get a job. <laughs> Not sure this is going to work. Um, and there are some days when I come in, quite honestly, and I still think I'm not sure this is going to work. But we have 10 years under our belt now, almost, and um, uh, I'm enormously gratified uh, by what I've seen over the last 10 years in terms of our ability to build this organization, Gra grateful as can be to the world for supporting us as the world has supported us. And I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, the Tribune's origin story. It's not going to be quite like the Joker movie, as origin stories go. I will not be smearing myself with black and yellow paint today in front of you and dancing around. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about how the Tribune got started 10 years ago, and I'm going to offer you 10 things. It could be a list of 100, but 10 things that have become a sort of fundamental or foundational takeaways for me as I think back on the 10 years to try to understand a little bit how about, uh, about how we think about the business 10 years in. So uh, I ran a magazine called Texas Monthly for a number of years. I was at the magazine for almost 18 years. I was the editor of the magazine for about eight years. I became editor-in-chief and president for the last year uh, without day-to-day -day responsibility for the magazine, but with still the uh, probably overall vision for how I wanted the magazine to look and feel and read in my head. Uh, I loved that job. Uh, I didn't so much leave there as go here. I really feel very warmly still toward the brand Texas Monthly and everything I learned there has uh, uh, really been the backdrop against which this Texas Tribune experience has played out. Had it not been for my time at Texas Monthly, there would not have been a Texas Tribune. Um, I was bored at the end, as I think after you spend 18 years any place, you probably begin to think about what you want to do next. Um, and I was also concerned about the state of the world. As I was sitting in my office every day in those last months at Texas Monthly, I was watching the number of reporters at the state capitol in Austin drop. I had seen over two decades almost uh, the number of news organizations in Texas drop. Um, when I got to Texas in 1991, there was still a Houston Post to go along with the Houston Chronicle. There was still a Dallas Times Herald to go along with the Dallas Morning News, there was a San Antonio Light as well as a San Antonio Express. Even as recently as 1991, there was still an afternoon newspaper in El Paso to go along with the morning paper. The number of reporters at the Capitol in 1991 when I arrived in Texas was three times what it was when I left Texas Monthly to start the Texas Tribune. And I think there are fewer, I think objectively people believe there are fewer reporters today than there were 10 years ago. Uh, there's just not enough coverage. There was not enough and is not enough coverage of this stuff, by which I mean politics, public policy, and state government. The for-profit economic model for covering politics and public policy in a state like Texas or maybe in a state like yours simply does not work. If you're in the for-profit business and part of your job is to return to whoever is supporting you financially an adequate percentage over and above their investment, you just really can't do that these days. It is hard. That is not to say that no one is making a go of this on the for-profit side, but it is absolutely the exception that proves the rule. But what we believed 10 years ago, and again, I think we still believe today, probably believe it even more, is just because you can't make a buck doing something doesn't mean it's not important. The kind of work that I was concerned was less and less in evidence 10 years ago and became the basis for the Texas Tribune was work that we consider to be a public good. Giving people in a community, whether it is Austin or Texas or one of your communities or in the United States of America, the kind of information that allows them to be more thoughtful and productive citizens, that gets them more civically engaged, motivates them to participate civically. 
there, that is in the public interest. That is a public service and that is a public good. So even if you can't make a buck doing it, there's an enormous value in doing that. Uh, and it was consistent absolutely with our decision to become a nonprofit news organization. Getting that 501c3 from the IRS to allow us to incorporate as a nonprofit was not simply about the tax-exempt status of the Tribune as a fact, although, of course, that is a material fact. But it was also about the idea that we were guided by a mission that this was not going to be a transactional relationship with the community we served. You pay us X and we provide you Y, but that we were providing something um, metaphysically more significant. This idea that it matters to be better informed and more engaged. It allows you to be a more uh, robust citizen in your community to take ownership of the issues that affect you and your fellow members of your community. And, um, our way to accomplish that goal of giving people what they needed was through the door of journalism. And of course, public media has been around for more than 50 years. You know, the fact is public radio and public television are the, you know, are the models on which we've based all of our organizations, right? Their economic model, their idea that, um, you, you serve a group of end users or stakeholders and those folks in turn come back and give you a couple bucks to support the important work that you do. So it, what we created at the Texas Tribune and what so many of you have come to the conclusion that you want to create is, is nothing new particularly, but the need is greater. The importance of this work is greater every single day. And so even though we realized that the for-profit model for providing this kind of work was not working, we said, we still got to figure out a way to do this. And so the Texas Tribune was born from that simple idea that it was important to provide persistent, reliable coverage, nonpartisan coverage of public policy and politics for the benefit of everybody in Texas and, and not in Texas. So it's a website, texastribune.org. As you know, that doesn't tell the whole story. We provide news data and events and a whole bunch of other things. Um, I think we're going to switch over to, can you go to the previous slide, Michael, please? Is there a previous slide? Well, there was a, a nice slide that set all this up, but the idea was me. Is it, how about that? Look at that. Okay, good. <laughs> Great. Uh, what I want to talk to you about, as I said, are basically some takeaways from the 10 years that we've had. And I could, again, with an ample amount of time, there are many more things I would want to tell you and could tell you about the experience we've had over the last 10 years, things we've learned, mistakes we've made that we've learned from, successes we've had that we didn't anticipate. But if I stand way back from the experience of these 10 years, there are, you know, there are probably a shorter list of things that I think are important to tell you. And so I want to talk to you a bit in the time that I have about the things that we've learned and taken away. The first of these, as strange as it may sound, is that for us, free has always been and remains a business model. The idea that you were going to give all your content away, that you're going to spend all this money to create all this content and then not charge people for it just seems weird, right? But fundamentally, if you are a mission-driven organization, you have a public service mission. It seems self-evident to me that the public interest is not served behind a paywall. I understand that you got to pay for this stuff. We'll get to that. But at the end of the day, if the goal is to get more people into a conversation about the priorities of their communities, if the goal is to give as many people as possible access to information that gives them the means to then activate civically, and the first thing you do is erect a barrier between them and that content, even for good reason, there's just something wrong about that. The goal here ought to be to achieve the mission of getting as many people as possible into a conversation by making that content as widely available as possible for free, but then find somebody or some bodies else to pay for your ability to make it free. That to me also seems self-evident. Somebody will pay, just not the people who are the audience that you're trying to reach. Now, for us, that means that content on our site is free, all but the Texas Tribune Festival. So all of those 50-plus events that Agnes will tell you about in detail in a short while, those are all free to attend. We give our content away to other media for free. So if you pick up the Waco paper, the Tyler paper, the Harlingen paper, Dallas, 
Houston sometimes, the big city sometimes, but more likely outside of the biggest cities, Lubbock, Amarillo, Corpus Christi, El Paso, McAllen, Brownsville, Kilgore. You will see Texas Tribune stories every single day, prominently in those pages and often on the front page. Bylined to the Texas Tribune, by, to a particular reporter, similar to how you might see somebody from the Associated Press or the New York Times Syndicate or whatever. We provide an email every single day that says, here's everything on our site right now, come and take it. Here's everything that's gonna be here tomorrow, come and take it. Here are graphics we've created, come and get those. Here are uh, photographs that we've assigned, we've cleared the rights, come take those. Everything that we produce is available for everybody else to run for free, again counter to the idea that there's an economic model that can be sustained if you're simply giving away everything. You figure you gotta charge people with that content. No, it's consistent with our mission not to charge. But then we turn around and we go to individuals and to foundations and corporations in those communities receiving that content for free. And we say, look at the value we're providing to your community. If you support us, you're supporting your community. There is an individual in the city of El Paso, one of the wealthiest men in the state, somebody who in the old days would have been called an industrialist. I don't know what the hell that means, right? He's just, that's just sort of the catch-all term for a rich guy, right? Who week after week after week, early in the time that the Tribune has been in business, was getting the El Paso Times on his doorstep and picking it up and seeing on the front page or in the, in the pages of the paper Stories from the Texas Tribune, story, story, story. And realize that we were doing something good for El Paso, a community he cares passionately about. And he realized then that by supporting the Texas Tribune, he was supporting El Paso. And he's become one of our largest individual donors annually. By giving the content away to the El Paso Times, in turn, it did get paid for. Just not by the paper. And what's the argument for not charging those news organizations, they don't have two sticks to rub together in most cases or they'd be doing this work themselves. What is the point of charging people who cannot afford to pay? They can't afford to pay for that content any more than they can afford to create that content themselves. So you acknowledge reality, healthy, right? You don't charge people because they can't pay anyway, but then you go around to foundations, individuals, and others, and you say, pay for our ability to continue to make this free. Free has been a successful business model for us for 10 years. And we are absolutely committed to not changing, no paywalls, no charging for content. When we announced our big ProPublica deal the last couple of days, $9 million investment almost over five years to do serious investigative journalism in, for, and about Texas. ProPublica's model is not to give its content away. Ours is. When we made the deal with ProPublica to team up on this, we said it is important to us, absolutely important to us, that when we produce all this amazing investigative journalism, we give it away to everybody. Consistent with what we have done all along. We're not going to veer from that. And they said, great. So this is a hugely uh, important part of what we do. Second thing is that the pitch whether it is to a major donor or a foundation, a corporate supporter, a regular person who wants to become a $10, $35, $60 member is, this is not about journalism, this is about democracy. It's about democracy. I have a, a, a real strong feeling about the importance of this in particular because we live in Divided times, polarized times, partisan times, if you talk about journalism to a certain segment of the population, especially in a state like Texas, you say journalism, they hear liberal, right? Talk about nonpartisan in a second. We're committed to not wearing the uniform of any team but Texas, right? We are scrupulously nonpartisan. As I say all the time, it's easy to be nonpartisan when you hate everybody, which I do. <laughs> But this is not about journalism. This is about providing people with the means to be more productive citizens. Giving them the kind of information that motivates them to participate civically. Everybody in every community in Texas is affected by the work done up the street at the Capitol on public education, on immigration, on health care, on transportation, on criminal justice, the whole bucket of issues. Everybody is affected by that stuff. Texas is a terrible state when it comes to voter turnout. 
Up until 2018, Texas was at or near the bottom in election after election after election in voter turnout. We were 41st in the country in 2018, which tells you something about Texas. 41st is the good news, right? The way that people get motivated to go from 50th or 49th or 48th at election time to 41st is by being given the kind of information that un unlocks their civic participation. And again, we do that through the door of journalism. We're not providing news, we're providing knowledge. We're not providing journalism, we're providing information. Where our democracy has gone off the rails in part is that people have checked out. They don't have reliable sources of information. And they're believing the line that government's bad, getting engaged in this stuff is bad. It's all just gonna be a big fight, big food fight. We talk in a civil tone of voice. We emphasize the importance of taking ownership of these issues. Here is what you need. We lead you to water. We can't make you drink, right? This is about democracy. Our state will be better if the people who live here are better informed and more engaged. We have distilled our mission, unchanged from the very first, down to this. Smarter Texans equal a better Texas. We can argue what smarter means. We can argue what better means. But that's fundamentally what it's about. How do we make Texas better? How do we make our democracy stronger through this work that we do? When I realized that this was about democracy and not journalism, it made the pitch to people at all points on the ideological spectrum easier. One of the, my favorite things about the Tribune is if you look at our donor wall, we are as transparent as any news organization in the country about our funding sources. If you look at the donor wall, you see the most Republican Republicans and the most Democratic Democrats, side by side, people who agree on nothing else in the world but the value of our work. And the way that we get people who agree on nothing to support the Texas Tribune is by not making it about journalism, but making it about democracy, because that's something that they can actually get behind and agree on. The third thing is, I am careful to say, nonpartisan is not non-thinking. When bullshit needs to be called, we call bullshit. At the end of the day, being nonpartisan doesn't mean that, you know, false equivalency, right? It doesn't mean shying away from telling the truth or going at people who need to be going, uh, at, gone at, right? I mean, that's not what this is about. Um, Nonpartisan means we don't editorialize on issues, we don't endorse candidates and campaigns, keep our thumbs off the scale. We talk to all sides, we try to report fairly, accurately, and thoroughly in everything that we do. But do not misunderstand what that means. Nonpartisan is not non-thinking. And we will scrap with people when we need to scrap with people. But the, the, the principle of nonpartisan journalism is significant to the success of the Tribune. I get farther away from Austin, I talk about nonpartisan journalism, the Snickers get louder. People think it's like jumbo shrimp, an oxymoron, right? But it's possible, and I think after the first six months, people saw that we were serious about that. There is nothing wrong with partisan journalism. There's a place for that. But I would submit to you that we live in the United States of confirmation bias. If you have voices in your head, there is a place to go, a source of information or news to go to get those voices reaffirmed. We all walk down the streets of our cities with headphones in to keep the world out. We curate our Twitter feeds and our cable boxes and our satellite radio channels to hear the things that affirm the voices in our heads. We have stopped talking to and listening to people we disagree with, by and large. It's an exaggeration, by and large. And okay, we want to be an antidote to that. And I'll talk a little bit about the importance of bringing people together of unlike mind in a second. Number four, diversity is about mission, not HR. We are absolutely 100% committed to the idea that if you are going to serve an audience, the news organization from the bottom to the top, including governance board, has got to adequately reflect back on that community, the diversity of that community. We have really focused the attention of this organization over the last 12 months in particular on this subject. We have published the diversity statistics 
of our staff better than we've been, better than a lot of other places, not where we need to be. Own the fact that we have work to do, develop policies around diversity in hiring, recruitment, retention, unconscious bias training, publish those. Put money in the budget specifically for the purpose of attacking the question of diversity in our content, in our staff, in our leadership, in our audience. Because budgets are moral documents, just as the cliche says. They tell you about your values. And if you believe in diversity, you gotta spend money to deal with this issue. Nine of the last 12 hires we've made at the Texas Tribune have been from uh, diverse people from diverse backgrounds. Now, what does that mean? We define diversity broadly, as diversity should be defined broadly. It's not just race and ethnicity, it's sexual orientation. It's physical disability. It is geography. It is socioeconomic status. It is where you went to school. It is all of those things. This newsroom would be better if we had more people who grew up in rural communities in Texas and went to rural universities or didn't go to college. We need all voices in the conversation about what we should be doing at all levels, most especially in leadership because the decisions made drive the work done. So we have to do that. We have to go at it proactively. Don't just go to the, uh, the NABJ and NAHJ conferences when you have a job, go when you don't. And build a pipeline of candidates, not only when you have a job, but when you don't. Get to know people so that when you have opportunities You've already had relationships with folks and you can bring people in and talk to them about jobs. The old idea that the Rooney rule is sufficient is way, way, way outmoded. And hold yourself accountable. Be public and transparent about your work. And hold yourself accountable through the same transparency that you ask of and demand of other people. Number five. The independence of your journalism as it relates to your funding sources is the entire ballgame. You can always get other money. You can never get other integrity. You get one shot. You fuck that up, you get no second shot. The minute anybody believes that your funders are driving your content, game over. I am never happier than when we piss off a donor and that donor dumps us. Right? I, I mean, seriously, I always go find another donor. I'll go find another foundation. I'll go find another corporate supporter. No donor gets to tell us what we can do or, don't, or can't do, ever. We are completely compulsively transparent about every source of funding. You can see every single dollar donated to the Texas Tribune in as close to real time as possible on our site, searchable, sortable, with the click of a button. Every single story has a paragraph at the bottom that says, here's anybody mentioned in this story who has a financial relationship with the Texas Tribune. No, we have not automated that. That is manual. And the reason is no one should wonder. Look, I ran a magazine that took significantly more money in advertising every month than we get in contributions. And yet, when we started the Texas Tribune, Howard Kurtz, who was at the time still at the Washington Post, said, how do we know that the donors to this new organization are not going to affect the independence of your journalism? I said, Howard, how do I know that the advertisers in the Washington Post don't affect the independence of your journalism? He said, well, they don't. I said, well, they don't. <laughs> right? The assumption somehow that nonprofit News organizations are more susceptible to being corrupted by their sources of funding is complete bullshit. So I just don't accept that premise, the premise of a question like that. And 10 years in, we don't get that question anymore, in part because we're completely transparent about the source of our funding. And at every turn, we have been almost, almost gleeful in taking the heads off of donors. Right? We'd always get more money. You can never get more integrity. And the first time you compromise your integrity in this kind of work is the last time you get to do this. So we're just very careful about saying that every time we can. Number six is you have and we have no competitors. There are only current and future collaborators. The old competitive circle 
or defensive crouch that we all found ourselves in in the old days is gone. You work with everybody. This is a hang separately or survive together time in journalism, which means, as I said earlier, every single day we send out an email at about three o'clock that has the budget lines for tomorrow in it that we send to other news organizations and we say, here's what we have coming up for tomorrow. Those of you who've been in the news business for a long time, could you ever imagine telling other news organizations what you were planning for tomorrow? They're gonna jump you. Isn't that the assumption that they're gonna jump you? You're telling the competition what you're doing. We don't care about that. Because we work with everybody, our reporters and their reporters team up to do something that neither of us could do independently. One plus one always equals more than two in journalism collaboration. Because we give all of our content away, they need to know what we're giving them. So we send them the list of things that we're gonna be publishing for tomorrow. I mean, this whole idea that somehow anybody is competition is crazy. And where does that go beyond simply the act of collaborating? We root for everybody. When Andrea Valdez, my old friend and former colleague at Texas Monthly, and her amazing team at the Texas Observer does serious and important journalism, as they do all the time, no one amplifies that louder than we do. It is in our interest to amplify the best work of other people in this space because their success is our success and our success is their success. If the mission of the Texas Tribune is to raise a level of civic engagement and to invigorate this civic conversation, whether that success is through our door or her door, doesn't matter. It's a victory, mission's achieved. So do not view anybody in your community as your competition. They are your brother or sister in arms. And that again has been a fundamental piece. And let me tell you something, that was not the view of the other media at the Capitol when we started. It was our view. We had a meeting, I, I just think back on this, the October of 2009, literally 10 years ago, could be 10 years ago today for all I know. John Thornton and Ross Ramsey and I on one side, John Thornton, Ross Ramsey and I on one side of the table and the editors of the Austin, San Antonio, Dallas, Fort Worth and Houston papers on the other side of the table. I refer to this as the Easter Island meeting <laughs> because they all sat staring at us like the statues on Easter Island on the other side of the table. <clears throat> And we, we came to them to tell them out of our own mouths what we intended to do. And they couldn't believe that we were gonna give content away for free, that we weren't coming after their market share. This is not to replace you. This is to augment what you're able to do with less resources than you used to have. And you know we're gonna give this away for free. And, da, 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 da. and they just were, they couldn't believe it. And they basically said to us, or they said to us in these literal words, you know, you're gonna be gone in a couple of years and we'll still be here. And this is just, you know, the thing that galled me at the time was they said, again, ineffectively, these words, we've stopped covering this stuff because nobody cares. And I said to them at the time, you got it exactly right, but you've got it exactly backwards. Nobody cares because you've stopped covering this stuff, right? You're forgetting that you have a fiduciary responsibility to the community you serve to put stuff in front of them that they need to stop and pay attention to. And you've decided not to do that. So of course, what happens is all those editors are gone in two years and we're still here. And then the people who replace them, when the mulch is overturned at the leadership of those papers, the people who come in are much more open to the idea of collaboration and they kind of get it. And so our relationship with those papers has been great. And at this point, we work with everybody. Number seven, from an audience development standpoint, as they say in a technology space, it's push, not pull. Do not wait for your audience to come to you, go to them. People are busier today than they were in their parents' generation. There are more things to fill the few hours they have to consume media. If you just basically sit around and wait for the audience to come to you, that is not a strategy. You gotta go to them. And in some cases, I mean literally, physically, go to them, almost individually. Grab them by the lapels and say, pay attention. Part of the success, I would argue, of our event strategy over time has been that we go into these communities where there is no media, there is no news, and we go on a college campus and we bring elected officials and we say, we're gonna talk about public education or water, healthcare. And it is not always the case, but it is almost always the case that the smaller the community we go into, the higher percentage of the population we turn out for one of these events because these people are starving for 
some dialogue on these issues. So we go to Canyon, 20 miles south of Amarillo, to West, Tex West, Tex West Texas A&M, or we, uh, university, or we go to uh, Sol Ross State University, the Harvard of West Texas, in Alpine, Texas, or we go to Stephen F. Austin uh, uh, University in East Texas, and we turn out a couple hundred people at these events. We provide lunch. We almost always have to add tables or add lunches at the last minute because people are just desperate to come out and be part of a conversation because these are news deserts. There is nothing going on. There is no conversation unless we curate it. We have to go to them, but they want us to go to them. And the reason that we've been able to grow the audience that we have so significantly over the last 10 years is in part because we have been intentional, deliberate, and aggressive in audience development strategies to go to these communities, to go to these audience segments, and to identify audience segments that we think we need to be pursuing, and then developing a strategy to go get those folks. Very important. Number eight, you are building a community. Never forget that. The business that you are really in is the business of building a community. These are not people who are passively receiving the content that you create. They're people who are desperate to be in a two-way, not one-way conversation. They want to talk to you. They want to talk back to you. They want to have relationships with the institution, with the individuals. They want an in-person touch, interaction. And they want to be with people they don't agree with. Believe me, they do. We see it all the time. They want to be in a room with people who have a different point of view and they want to have the opportunity in a civil way to hash out their differences. This is the thing that is missing. This is the thing that you provide. To use the phrase that is popular these days, but to use it in a non-pejorative way, they want a safe space. They want you to be the honest broker. They want you to be the convener. And they want you to give them a means to talk to you, with you, past you, with one another, you are building a community. Some months ago, more than a year ago, I believe, we created a closed Facebook group called This Is Your Texas. Who gives a shit about Facebook groups, right? Who, who even thinks this is a strategy, right? No, we did this. It, it, had to be, it had to be approved as a member of this group, and we have a person who curates the conversation, leads the conversation, and... There's a different topic every month. People on the, in the group suggest topics. And it's a civil conversation about these big controversial issues that in other contexts would be just blowing off the roof every time. It has been such an overwhelming success. The, the, the seriousness of the conversation, honestly, a lot of great stories have been generated through the conversation that we moderate and monitor on this channel. People are desperate to be in that kind of a conversation. It is a community that you're building. This will be my lower back tattoo one day. I think I told the Commonwealth people it was going to be something else. I'm always toying with one day what will be my lower back tattoo. Probably will be this shit won't pay for itself. But that's okay. It has to be paid for. And you can do this. And it's hard. It's hard. I didn't know jack squat about fundraising when I started the Tribune. I'd been on some nonprofit boards. I'd been asked for money, so I knew what it was like to be on the receiving end, and I'd asked for money for some causes I cared about. But I didn't know how to ask rich people for money. I certainly didn't know how to talk to foundations or navigate that whole deal. But you know what? If you're honest with people about what your intentions are, and if you say what you're going to do and do what you say, and if you have a good pitch, and if you have a good product to sell, it begins with the product. Then people will respond. My beloved Terry Quinn, who you will meet soon, my dear friend of 25 years and our chief development officer, I will fight you for the title of I have the best chief development officer, and I will win every time. Uh, to this morning at 7 o'clock, I text her. I say, can you update the all-time slide? Oh, I was already thinking about updating it because she's always like five steps ahead of me. This is the all-time actuals revenue generated by the Texas Tribune up to and including this morning, a little less than 10 years. 
And one of the things you see on this slide is that we have built a diverse series of revenue sources that allow us over time to have reasonable uh, protection from the vagaries of fundraising and the economy and what have you. I mean, we're all susceptible to external forces. How many times in the nonprofit news space over the last few months have the words Trump recession been uttered with great trepidation? We all don't know what's coming, right? If anything's coming. And we're probably all fucked if that happens. But this is where we have landed after 10 years. And it's not five equal buckets, but it's ish, right? Major individual gifts, gifts of $5,000 or more from individuals or family foundations. Major gifts from foundations, that's institutional philanthropy. Membership is membership. It's everything below $5,000. It's a combination of small dollar memberships from individuals and the elite circles of membership where you go to a rich person, basically, and you say, come on, give me all your money. No. Come on, you give me all your money. No. Come on, you know you have it. <laughs> I'm just not that into you. Okay. <laughs> then commit to giving me 1000 a year or 2500 a year or 5000 a year for three years, and you'll buy your way out of having to hear from me again. Done. <laughs> Corporate sponsorship is the artist formerly known as advertising. Right, And events revenue is primarily sponsorship of events, although, as Agnes Varnum will tell you, we do generate significant revenue from ticket sales at the Tribune Festival, and that's a portion of it, but it's about 10% annually, or some amount, 15% annually. And then the earned income is work for hire, paid newsletter, you know, licensing of content to textbooks. I mean, it's a modest, I mean, look, $3 million over 10 years is nothing to sneeze at, but it's a modest amount of money, relatively speaking. So this is it, $74 million and change over 10 years. All to pay for journalism, which is great. Last thing I'm going to say, and I'm actually, I'm sort of landing the plane safely, which is remarkable, is the, the, only, the only way forward is forward. This seems obvious. Running in place is not a strategy. You know, the, in the music business, they say you take 18 years to make your first record and six months to make your second, right? Um, the hardest day doing this work is not day one, it's day two. And you can be forgiven for thinking that once you get this thing stood up and you get it going, you're like, okay, work's done. No, 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 no. Work is just beginning. And every year has to be better than the year before. Every year has to be better. The content has to be better. The fundraising has to be better. The strategy has to be tweaked and improved. We hear all the time, Terry and I, when we go out and see foundations, what are you going to do in two years? What, well, how is this going to be different? I had a job candidate come in yesterday, somebody who I thought just aced her interview in part because she said, what's Tribune going to be like in five years? And I went, well, that's an interesting question. You don't get asked that very much. But you get asked it by funders actually more often than not. And the fact is you got to have a plan for the future. Got to. And it can't be the same plan. It can't be, well, you like what we did this year. How about we do the same thing next year? No. We have a strategic plan. Took 16 months to put together. Full staff participation, bottom to top, plus some outside folks. Passed it out of our board in April of last year. Published it on the website in September for three reasons, partly because we wanted the people who support the Texas Tribune, reading, giving, and all that, to see where this was all heading in the next seven years. Partly because we know that there are wonderful folks like you all who are looking to us to say, how are you doing it? We'd like to see what we can figure out from your success that we can take and apply in our case. But part of it is what I said about diversity earlier, hold yourself accountable. We published that strategic plan on our website in part to remind ourselves what we've committed to doing. And, and our commitment is to be better in every way every year than the year before. And that's hard. But, of course, all of this is hard, right? I am joyful after 10 years about this work. I love being, Andrea will tell you, I love being at Texas Monthly. I did not have a bad day at Texas Monthly in 18 years. I was very sorry to leave. Cried like a baby on the day that I told them I was leaving. Hated it. 
As I look back now, that was a job. This is a calling. This is the work of my life, right? Lightning strikes me today, dead. I will feel like I spent the last 10 years in a way that had honor and purpose and was productive. Because what we're doing is important. It's important in Texas. It's important in Vermont. It's important every place you are because people need you. And so your success is their success, and their success is your success. I'll stop and let Agnes take over, and I will see you again this afternoon. Okay, thank you. Okay.